much for this day. Your love is so amazing, and your grace is speechless. Thank you so much for all that you've done for us, for dying on the cross, for freeing our minds, for giving us the power to be free from sin. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we might be called the children of God. We are your children. We are children of God. And because of this, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. We are princesses and princes in Jesus Christ. We claim your promises, O Lord, and may our actions speak louder than our words. Please be in our hearts right now. We invite Jesus Christ into our hearts right now. Tune our minds to your message. May your voice be heard at this time. May there be less of me and less of everyone in this room, and be, may your gospel be heard. May your name be glorified. Jesus, may you receive the worship that is due your name and the glory that is due your name. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, praise team. That was amazing, and... I am so happy to be here. My name is Jesse Reese Huggins, and um, I am currently a transitioning member of Kinesa Fellowship, well, Seventh Day Adventist Church. I am currently attending York University, and I'm in my second year of studying French, French studies. And I'm part of Morning Star Christian Fellowship. Has anybody here heard of Morning Star Christian Fellowship? Amen. Beautiful. It is a hard work, and it's a blessed work, and I'm so happy that God has enabled me to be a witness on campus. He has blessed me with friends, and friends for life, truly, and it's been an amazing experience. Um, I brought my best friend with me, Nancy. She's sitting in the front, and later on, she'll be blessing us with a special music. So, praise God. Um, at this moment, I just want to thank God for his amazing grace and his sustenance. I, I thank him for enabling me to stand here before you and for all those youth that are sti sitting in the pews and, and wondering, okay, how does somebody this young get here? Um, it's God. It's all about him. It's, it's really, truly all about him. And at this moment, I, I just want to thank um, thank him for the mentors that he's put in my life. And I want to say that um, it's amazing what, what you can do when you believe in God. It's amazing what, what things can happen when you open up your mind to receive him. And that's pretty much what our discussion is going to be about today. It's about the battle that's going on in our minds. I believe that the mind is a powerful thing, and God created an amazing thing, and he knew what he was doing when he created our minds. And the wonderful thing that we have, this g uh, is a gift that I think you should all be aware of, and that is the freedom of choice and the ability to give substance to your thoughts. Each and every one of you has the power and the ability to validate anything that comes into your mind. And this is what makes your mind so amazing and so precious because it is a powerful tool. You can make yourself believe anything you want. You can create anything you want, whether it's in the realm of God's truth or not. And that is the beauty of believing in God and believing in Christ because you validate him, but you do it with free will. And therefore, he has not forced you to do anything. You are not pressured to do anything. You see the reasoning from the scriptures. You see the sense that it makes, and you agree with it, and you choose to follow it. The topic that I was asked to preach upon was temptation. And I think temptation has a lot to do with our mind, more so than any tactic that the enemy has. We're all aware and familiar with the armor of God. 
and that we're in a battle. Amen? And that as Christians, we need to be aware of what the, the plan is. We need to have strategy. We need to know what it is we're doing on this battlefield. But we also know that the battle is not ours. It's whose? It's the Lord's. Amen. And so at this time, I would like you to meditate on the very different aspects of temptation. The many different ways that Satan tries to tempt us as it will. Think of his strategy and think of the ways he tries to manipulate us. Does he stand up strong and mighty and say, I'm Satan, please join my team because I'm a winner. I beg to differ. He's subtle and he's conniving. The Bible compares him to a serpent. The Bible also compares him to a lion roaring and roaming around, seeking whom he may devour. This may be scary to think of, but remember, you have the power to choose. You have the power of a sound mind if you accept Christ. And this is where the battle is won. Jesus won the war, but there is a battle going on in your mind, and you need to know where your thoughts stand. You need to know who is the center of your worldview. You need to be in the right place. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And so we've talked about the deceptive devil and how he tries to attack us at our weakest points. If you look at how a lioness attacks her prey, she lurks in the grass. She blends in, and you see the gazelle. Everybody's familiar with the gazelle, right? Now, have you ever seen those uh, documentaries, Discovery Channel, where you see gazelles hopping? They're running and they're hopping. Does anybody know what that's called? Stotting. You guys are awesome. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Brilliant minds. Praise God. They're stotting. Do you know why they stot? Actually, I just learned this last night. We actually had a Bible study at Morningstar, um, about we were studying broken chains, and one of the discussion leaders told us that in the pack of gazelles, the ones who stot are showing off to the lionesses that they're fast. Not only can they run super fast, but they can jump in the air, and they can keep on running and jump in the air again. Now, that takes a lot of breath. Would you not agree? And the lionesses will take this sign. They're communicating, and they understand, okay, you... I'm just going to leave you alone because I'm not going to waste my breath. There's a bunch of slow ones in the back here. I'm just going to focus on that area. <laughs> and this is where they go. Now, we as Christians need to stop. Okay? Amen. Praise the Lord. We need to stop. But the question is where? Where are we starting? In our minds. We need to know that we're fast up here. We need to have direct access to the word, direct access to prayer, direct access to Jesus Christ. As Christians, we have emotions that can slow us down. And this is exactly where Satan tries to attack our emotions. You have family problems. You're insecure. You are not good at reading. You're not good at speaking. You're not good at listening. You don't know God. You've been out on the streets. You used to be a prostitute, or you used to do drugs. You're not able to run with this pack. You're not strong enough. This is what we're told day in and day out. You know, Satan used to accuse us before God. And we remember that when, when there was a meeting in the heavens, and Satan comes and says, oh, I've been walking around this world, and I know that there's no one here who loves you. And, and what did God say? Have you considered? Have you considered my servant Job? We need to be like Job. But even more so because God did his part on the cross. Now Satan knows that the battle is no longer 
in God's hands. The battle is in our mind. We need to choose to put it in God's hands. He's given us power. I know a lot of people are struggling, including myself. I was struggling with, how am I going to win this? How am I going to fight this? How am I going to do this? The devil's so strong, and he knows so much. How can I do this as a youth, almost as a child? How can I take on this battle in this world that is so full of temptation, so full of sin? And I realized you have to completely surrender your will to God. Completely surrender your mind, your thoughts, and be honest with yourself and be true to yourself and open your mind up to God. Now, to give you a better understanding of this, we're going to look in the book of 1 Kings. And it's in chapters 18 and 19 that we're going to focus on. And this is a story about Elijah. Now, I know there are many stories, many exciting stories about Elijah, but I want us to focus on the fact that number one, he was a man. And a lot of us think that he was a man that was so close to God. He was, oh, number one, amazing, a powerhouse. You look at Moses and, and, and how he is a pillar. He was a pillar for the Israelite nation. You look at David and how he was a man after God's own heart. And Elijah, a prophet, who in many ways stood alone now let's turn to 1 Kings 18 and focus on the story of Elijah that we're going to get into. And it says, if all have found it, please say amen. 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 And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. Verse 2, So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab, and there was a severe famine in Samaria. I'm going to stop there. Now, is everybody familiar with this story? We have a famine going on, and it's been going on for a long time. And the Lord is telling Elijah, go, go see Ahab and tell him that I'm going to send rain from heaven. Now, Elijah's good at this point. He's faithful, and he stands up. He's bold. We'll continue verse 3, and Ahab called Obadiah, who was in charge of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for so it was, while Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah had taken 100 prophets and hidden them, 50 to a cave, and had fed them with bread and water. Now, do you think that Elijah is aware of this? Do we know that Elijah is aware of this fact? I don't think so. He's not. This is something that only Obadiah knows. Now, if we continue on to verse 12, and he says, oh, sorry, I apologize. Seventeen, I apologize. So here we have Elijah meeting Ahab. And we have, then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 400 and the 50 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So this is what's happening. There is a ruler on board, and his name's Ahab, and he's, his queen is who? Queen Jezebel. And they've decided that they're going to worship this Baal. And they've got their prophets, and they've got their army set up, and they think they know who's boss upstairs. And now we have this Elijah who walks up boldly and says, excuse me, 
I'm not the one causing this famine. I'm not the one causing this problem. It's you and your sin. And he calls them. He's in a place where he's right with God, right enough to call somebody else's trouble, call somebody else's sin, and he's fine. Now, at this moment, I just want to clarify that we're painting a picture of who Elijah is. And the story is very interesting because many times we think that when we're facing temptation, if we're not a good enough Christian, if we're not a a big enough Christian, if we haven't stood on the pulpit and preached, if we haven't, you know, read enough Bible verses, then there's no way that we could stand temptation. We're not, we're not, you know, strong enough and we're not good enough. And we're going to learn as we read on that the Lord is strong enough and the Lord is good enough to help you as long as you call upon his name. He doesn't always show himself in the big things. Some of you might think this is a big thing. But let me tell you that each and every one of you has the power of reasoning in your mind to open up yourself to God and to make sure that you're right up here. Because even if I'm speaking to you now, if I'm not right up here, then it's not me that's going to be in a right place. The Holy Spirit might use me and you might hear the words. But if they don't touch my heart and if I don't accept them, then I'm just as worse as any sinner. Focus on this as we see the great Elijah in this experience. And so as we continue on in pay on verse 27 we hear or read and so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them. He mocked the prophet. And I apologize for not giving more background, but at this time, what he's done is he's accused these prophets of sinning. He's accused the whole nation of sinning. And what he does, he says, call your prophets, call these people up, and let's have a showdown. Let's see whose God is the real God. And he allows them to do their service, to do their worship, and to call down fire from heaven to burn a sacrifice. And he says, and so they have started from morning. They go until evening. They begin to cut themselves, chanting and waving around and doing their ceremonies. And verse 27 says, and so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, cry loud, for he is a god. Either he is meditating or he is busy or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud and cut themselves, as they say, as was their custom, with knives and lances until the blood gushed out of them. So here we are. Elijah's gotten downright, you know, sarcastic, for lack of a better word. He, is, he knows who God is, and he's sure of himself. And he says, look, if your God is really here, you know, where is he? We've been here since morning. It's noon already. But he continues and allows them to do their thing. Now, at the end of this verse, we see that fire comes down from heaven when Elijah, it's Elijah's turn. And not only was it just the sacrifice being burned, but water, three pails of water were poured onto this sacrifice, as well as a moat, I believe. There was a moat around it. And fire came from heaven, and it sucked up the water, as well as it burnt the sacrifice. And all fell on their faces and worshipped God. Now, if we read in 1 Kings 19, Elijah's response to this amazing experience, He's just called fire down from heaven in the name of God. And we see, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And mind you, after this sacrifice, he killed and slaughtered all these prophets. And it says also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, that, 
he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Now, I wouldn't want to be that servant, personally. (laughs) You know, you're sitting here thinking, you know, yeah, we're ready. You know, one battle's been won. Let's get on this boat. And your prophet runs away. I think this is important, ladies and gentlemen. This is really important. This meant who was closer to God at this point? Could you imagine standing here and saying, fire, come on down? And then in a second, running away from God? I'm telling you, no position you're in is going to change your mind. If you're not secure in every area of your life, if you're not secure in who God is to you, then you're going to run. You're going to run away when the rubber hits the road, when you're scared. No matter what fears you, you're going to run. As Christians, we need to be grounded. As the Bible says, founded upon the rock. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, no other ground is sinking sand. It is so important. Now, in terms of framing our minds, in considering temptation, let us look at what Jesus has said about repentance and forgiveness. Repentance, number one, because I find that many times we feel that we're not good enough, even after we've repented, or we think that we haven't said enough or done enough. Number one, Christ does it all. As I mentioned before, it's all about Christ. But let's see what he says. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Luke 23, 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. Luke 5, 24. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. In each of these scenarios, we see God as loving, caring, and willing to forgive. And not only that, but he is faithful. He has grace, and he's provided this forgiveness for us. Now, as Christians, if we're supposed to be founded on a rock and we're supposed to have armor, number one, we need to ask for forgiveness, believing that this is the last time. We want to be forgiven. We want to move forward. We don't want to keep coming back because there's no moving forward at that point. If you want to ask for forgiveness, you get it all out. You get everything you want to talk about, and believe me, there is time. This is your life. This is your whole life you have ahead of you. You have enough time to take the time with God, to spend it with him, and to get everything out, everything down, and believe. Belief is key here. We have to believe that he is, has enough power. He has the power to cleanse us from our sins. And it says, us he, it says it here that if we confess our sins, he is faithful to do it. So it's left to your mind to, the, to do the job. He calls us to repentance. Now for those who might not be familiar with asking for forgiveness, who might not be familiar with Why should I have to repent? Or what is it that I am repenting for? Jesus came into the world, and one of his first words were, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We are a human race that, if you read the word, have fallen from grace. And Christ is here to set up a kingdom of peace. If you look around you and if you look at the world, there is nothing that says peace. If you want to ask somebody, if you won $10 million, what would you want to do? Or if you had three wishes, what would you want to do? Oh, I'd want to give it to the poor. I'd, I wish for world peace. Well, let me tell you, this is amazing news. Jesus came to do this one thing, and he's doing it for free. But the condition is, we have to repent. And why not? What is there to hold on to? Is there anything attractive in sadness, in sorrow, in famine, in grief? Is there anything attractive in letting our 
morals decline, letting our children run loose, letting violence run rampant, is there anything meritable in that? Nothing. And so we realize in Revelation 2.5, remember therefore from when you ha- where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. This is speaking to the church, a church who he is calling to love. He's saying, remember the first fruits. We remember that there are the fruits of the Spirit that we need to meditate on daily. Remember the first fruits. There is something that you have to replace the things that you're asking for forgiveness for with. And you replace them with the fruit of the Spirit. You replace them with love. You replace them with the happiness that God gives you. You realize that, okay, there's no more pain. There's no more sorrow. There's no more giving up. There's no more defeat. And you claim the promises. I can name them all for you now, but I encourage you to look in your Bibles. Go online. Go and type up words that you feel would be in there, verses that you've heard. Talk to a friend and search them out. I want to know God's promises, and I want to claim them for myself so that you can memorize them, so you can meditate upon them day and night. The Bible says meditate on the word day and night, that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. If you're going to stand on the rock, when I mention worldview, that means every area of your life. You know that every question you would ever have, you find that answer and you, you know God's answer. You know what God's answer is in the, in, in the areas of your life that you're insecure about. You know where you stand. When we say we're standing with the armor of God, we have to stand with the truth that he's given us, the gospel that he's given us, the peace that he's given us. We have to have our minds focused on salvation. There is a truth in the gospel. There is a truth in the word. It is a mystery, but yet the Holy Spirit reveals it unto us. And if you focus your mind on these things, if you focus your mind on whatever is noble, whatever is great, whatever is holy, let us turn to Philippians 4 so you guys can get a better understanding of the picture I'm trying to paint. Recognizing that you get to choose whatever you believe. You validate anything that comes into your mind. And the Lord says, well, if you're going to validate anything, Why not validate this? Verse 8, Philippians 4, verse 8. And I'd like you guys to read it with me. It would feel good. Do something in unity together. I'm reading from New New King James, but let's go. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that amazing? You know, I tried it in the store the other day, and it really worked. I'm telling you, there's so many things that can go through your mind. Um, like, we spoke about it last night at the, at the fellowship, and we were saying how we're human beings of emotions. You can go through so many emotions. You know, men like to talk about women, well, I'm saying in the world, you know, oh, they're moody, they're, you know, mood swings, and they're here and they're there, and you never know what they're feeling. Well, I think that human beings are like that in general. Honestly and truly, I, can, I can't even name the amount of emotions I feel in a day. I can't even describe them. Sometimes I'm just like, oh, I don't know what I feel. I just feel, you know, there's nothing, you, you, you can't. And that's the time you need to know, you know what? If you can't even name what you're feeling, let's just meditate on these things, okay? Let's just, let's just get back to the book. And 
that's where we need to be. And I'm, I'm telling you, it is an amazing thing. Why not meditate on something happy or something good? Sing a song, sing a hymn, and get those thoughts out of there. That's the Holy Spirit's work. He's going to work with you. You see a negative thing coming on, you say, hold up. Holy Spirit, come on in. You take the emotion, you place it in front of you, you say, okay, me and God, we're going to stay the same. We're one-on-one. We're going to work this out, and we're going to deal with this emotion. We have things to do. There is a work to do. If God wants to work with you, if we're his little soldiers, and we're sitting there, oh, I don't know how I feel. I don't know what I'm doing. Then how is he going to ask us to go? Go and preach the world to Judea and all of Samaria and to all the ends of the earth. You know that's the last thing that needs to be done? Preaching of the gospel. Telling people Jesus died. He died for us. He saved us. And his salvation is free. You know, people are dying for this. I see it on campus. I see it when I'm handing out flyers. And the devil's telling me, oh, they think you're stupid or they think you're, you know, whatever. But no. God is a God who saves. He has salvation. He has the kingdom of peace coming. He has everlasting life coming. And nobody in the world can top that. No one. I want to end with a couple of verses for encouragement. And this is when even your own heart, even your own heart tells you, no, I can't do it. Oh, I'm too bad, or I don't have enough. I don't have enough faith. I, I can't do this. Let me go to 1 Corinthians 4, 3 to 4. And it says, I'll let you guys get to it. And honestly, there are times, like I I sat there even this morning, can I go up there? Can I go talk to them? I can't do this. Praise the Lord. God is amazing. I don't even know how he does these things. He's just awesome. And this is something that on on a woman's retreat, Donna Jackson shared with me. And it's to guard your heart. It's to let you know that, you know what? You're going to feel emotions, but God is greater than those emotions. And it says in 1 John 2, oh, I apologize. Well, first of all, we'll go with this one. We'll do the next one after. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you. I believe this is Paul talking to the Corinthians. Or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. Don't even judge yourselves, brethren. If you don't know the whole mystery of the gospel, what are you using as a tool to judge yourself with? Give it up to God. Just let him do it. Ask him. The, the psalmist says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if you find any wicked way within me and lead me into the way everlasting. That's your judgment tool. God knows you. And he judges without partiality. Believe it or not, we have partiality with ourselves. If you take any self, self-help self course, they'll tell you, oh, you're hard on yourself. You need to take it easy on yourself. Believe me, praise God, he takes it easy on us. He says, for I know nothing myself, yet I am not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Praise God. 1 John 2, 20 and 22. Oh, I apologize. 1 John 18, verse 20. No, this is not. Okay. Let's just use the Bible. I apologize. Oh, amen. Okay, we're in 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. And this is our closing text. Amen. We have it. So it says, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth, 
and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. Amen. At this time, I just want to invite anybody, anybody who, even if you, you don't feel it, I hope that you don't feel it and you just come because it makes sense. If what you heard made sense, if what you heard makes perfect sense, you want your heart to be guarded, you want your mind to be guarded, you want to have more faith, come and ask for more faith. You know, my experience with appeals has been amazing. And sometimes I wonder, okay, I'm baptized. Does this mean I can go too? Can I come up now? Come, if it makes sense. Come and just stand for God. I believe that it's a good thing to practice. You want to be able to stand up for Jesus Christ. And if you feel that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, if you feel that the things you've heard have made sense, uh, come and just lay it all before him. It's a personal choice. It's between you and God. And don't think about anybody else here. Just think about you. Just think about what God has done for you in your life. And know that he loves you. And he's standing here with open arms. And he's waiting to give you the most amazing experience that you've ever had in your entire life. So I ask for anybody who wants to go in faith, who wants to go in love, who wants to go in hope, for anybody who feels that they're lacking faith, hope, and love, please come to the front. I'm going to ask now for Nancy to come and, and share her song with us. Praise God, that was beautiful, Jesse. I thank God and praise God for our friendship and allowing us to grow together in Christ. It's beautiful. Philippians 4, 6 says, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Just have faith. Trust in God. He is here. So I wrote this song a couple of months, a year ago, because I write songs, and it fits perfect with what Jesse was sharing to us today, sharing today about keeping faith, holding fast to God, clinging to his word. Hold fast to his words, be strong to your faith, and he will never leave you, standing as a rock, never to be moved unbelief. Lord, I believe. Take away my sin. You are my all. You are my best. You give us everything we need. All you ask in return is for our faith. If you can try, sing along. Say, I believe. Take away my unbelief. Lord, I believe. Take away my sin. You are my I believe, take 
everyone, if we could all kneel at this time. Everyone in the pews as well. Most gracious and loving Father, at this time we give you praise and honor and glory. At this time we humble ourselves before you and we give you it all. Lord, I just want to ask that you will cleanse me from all unrighteousness again and just open me up, dear God, and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I'd like to take the place of all those kneeling before you at this time. Lord, I come before you. This is my life. Please take it. I only have today, and I ask that you would just take today and work on me. Have mercy upon me and forgive me for my sin. I come before you wanting this joy, wanting this happiness, wanting the peace of eternal life, and wanting you to take control of my mind. I believe, dear God, take away my unbelief. I believe in all the promises that you have given me, all the blessings that you have given me in my life. I believe that I deserve them because Jesus died on the cross for me and you said that I am a special treasure. You have promised me that I will live for, with you for eternity if I just, tr just trust in you and trust in your promises. Lord God, please give me hope. Please give me an increase of faith, dear God. And I thank you. Thank you for hearing and answering my prayers. Thank you for he hearing my plea. But Lord, I have struggles. Lord, there are things in my life that I don't know what I'm going to do about. I'm struggling with finances. I'm struggling with my family. I'm struggling with personal issues that I'm even afraid to tell you. Lord God, I've sinned, and I see myself as a sinner. And I don't know how I could get I possibly get close to you, but Lord, I ask you to make a way. You are in control of everything, and you are strong enough to do everything. Please, please help me to build a relationship with you. Lord, push away the world and push away all the lies that have been fed to me. Please put the lie where it belongs, in Satan's mouth. Lord, you wish that none should perish, but that all might have everlasting life. And at this moment, we ask that we might have everlasting life, dear God. And the life that we are living now, please help us to live it more abundantly and help us to accept the freedom that you've given us. Lord, we ask that you will put us into ministry where we should be. Put us where you we should grow dear God you are planting us like a seed and I pray that we will grow as the seeds of joy to be able to spread the gospel to all the world Lord prepare us dear God prepare us as a body of people as a family we pray for Kenisa Church dear God that they might grow in love and that they ne might never decrease in love but always work together for each other in Christ may they love each other in in indeed dear God and in truth Lord God, I pray that your will may be done in our lives. And at this time, we accept Jesus Christ into our hearts. We rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus Christ, knowing that he is defeated and that God is ruler over all. And he deserves all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. We thank you and praise you. Please keep our minds at this time. Take away doubt. Take away pain and suffering. And Lord, help us to believe. This we pray in Jesus' most precious and holy name. Amen.